Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Williams. I, uh, you know, you really paved the way here with your AFRI program. And uh, it's, it was visionary and ahead of its time, and I really salute you for that. And I salute each of you for the incredible sacrifices and commitment and dedication and service to our country. That's why I've, I've, this is my fifth year in a row to be here, because I, in my own small way, just want to support what you're doing, because what you're doing is, is making such a meaningful difference. You know, we tend to think of advances in medicine as a new drug, a new laser, something really high-tech and expensive. And we often have a hard time believing that the simple choices that we make in our lives each day, like what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and perhaps most important, how much love and support we have, that these simple changes can make such a powerful difference, but they do. Uh, you could shorten that to eat well, stress less, move more, and love more. And it's hard to believe that these simple things can make such a difference. But what we've done in our almost 40 years of research is to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. <clears throat> but if you had to boil it down to one idea, one organizing principle, it's really what is the cause. And, if you, and whatever the problem is, if it's in the military, if it's in medicine, if it's whatever it is, if you can deal with whatever the underlying cause is, it's a much more powerful and effective intervention. But so often we treat the symptoms, and especially in medicine. I got interested in doing this work when I was learning how to do bypass surgery with Michael DeBakey, the heart surgeon who developed and invented it. And we'd cut people open, we'd bypass their clogged arteries, he'd tell them they were cured. And then more often than not, they'd go home and do all the things that had caused the problem in the first place. They'd smoke and not manage stress and eat junk food and not exercise, and their, their bypasses would often clog up, so we'd cut them open again, sometimes two or three times. And so for me, that became a metaphor of not dealing with the cause. If you just treat the symptoms and not the cause, the same problem tends to come back again, or you get a new set of problems or side effects. Or on a health policy level, you may have painful choices, or on the battlefield, you may have painful choices. But what we're finding is that if we can use these lifestyle choices not just as preventing disease, but even as treating disease, that our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing. And there's a convergence of forces that make this the right idea at the right time. The first, the limitations of high-tech medicine are becoming increasingly clear. The studies have shown more recently that bypass surgery, angioplasty, stents, radical prostatectomies, drug treatments for diabetes really don't work very well. And I'll talk about that more in a moment. At the same time, the power of these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions, like what we're doing, are becoming more, more well-documented. And Obamacare, whatever you think about it, is really turning all the incentives and reimbursements on their ear. So before, in a fee-for-service environment, the more operations you do, if you're a doctor or a hospital, the more money you make. Now it's here's X amount of dollars to take care of somebody. You, the doctor, the hospital gets to keep what's left over. So the fewer things you do, the more money you make. But if the patient ends up in the hospital, that comes out of your pot of money, too. So turning off that faucet around the sink that's overflowing is not only medically effective, but it's also cost effective. Now, what we're able to show, and what I want to share with you today, is that our bodies, in most cases, have a, a, a truly amazing, remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than when we had once realized if we treat the underlying cause, if we turn off that faucet. And all these things I'm going to share with you today were thought impossible. And part of the value of doing science research is that it can really give many people new hope and new choices by giving them new possibilities of things that were thought impossible before. And because it's such a, a, a powerful intervention, it's a disruptive technology in the same way that a, an iPhone was when it first came out, or a, an electric car like a Tesla. Uh, it's really changing the whole paradigm of how we do things. Now, I began doing this work when I was a medical student, and I took a year off between my second and third years of medical school to do the first pilot study of 10 patients. And then we showed that was working, then did a randomized trial a couple of years later on a small scale for just uh, a month. And then the most definitive study, I went to Boston to do my medical training, then moved to San Francisco. And we used uh, the state-of-the-art measures to look at heart disease. We looked at the state-of-the-art measure of blockages in the arteries called angiograms. And where the arrow is on the, on the top there is a, uh, a narrowing because one of the arteries that feeds the heart is clogged. The heart pumps blood to the body, as we all know, but it pumps blood to itself first, which when you think about it is a nice metaphor. It takes care of its own needs so that it can then take care of the rest of the body. 
Is that selfish or is it unselfish? Well, it's both. It's kind of like when you're on an airplane and they say if, a, if there's a decompression in the cabin and the oxygen mask comes down, what do they tell you? Put it on yourself first, because if you put it on your small kid and the kid doesn't know what to do and then you both pass out and die, that's not going to help anybody. So when you take care of yourself, it's actually the, the most important thing you can do as a leader because not only are you setting a great example for the people that you're commanding, but you're also going to function at a much higher level so you can do that even more effectively. So what we found is that instead of this narrowing here where the first arrow is, a year later is wider, it's less clogged. That had never been shown before. And because the blood flow is a fourth power function of the diameter, these small improvements in the diameter get magnified exponentially. So there was a 300% improvement in blood flow to the heart. These are what call, are called PET scans, positron emission tomography. And blue and black in the lower left here means no blood flow. Orange and white a year later is maximal blood flow. So these changes are dramatic. They're the kinds of changes you would normally see by cutting someone open and doing a bypass or putting a stent in, but without the costs. And the only side effects are good ones. 99% of the patients stop to reverse the progression of their heart disease who made these changes. Um, that's, of course, my mom said, what about that other 1%? But that's another story. Um, <laughs> and there was a 300% improvement in blood flow to the heart from very skeptical observers when they did that. When we looked at all the arteries and all the patients, in the red line, the control group, who were making more moderate changes, they got worse after one year and even worse after five years. That's what usually happens to people, is they get worse and worse. That was called the natural history of heart disease, is to get worse and worse. But instead of getting worse and worse, we found they could get better and better. They showed some reversal after one year in the green line, and even more reversal after five years. And I think these findings are giving millions of people at this point, new hope and new choices that they didn't have before. And none of the people were taking drugs who made these changes. These are just from lifestyle changes alone. Half of the comparison group got put on Lipitor and other statin drugs during the course of the study. The drugs slowed down the rate at which they got worse, but they weren't enough to actually reverse it. Whereas the lifestyle changes alone could reverse it, even without the costs. And with, you know, Lipitor alone, uh, before it became generic, was $14 billion a year just in the U.S. alone. So if we're trying to control healthcare costs, one of the easiest ways to do it is to teach people how to change their lifestyle. One of the interesting findings was that the more people changed, the more they improved. I thought that the younger people who had less severe disease would be more likely to show improvement, but I was wrong. It wasn't how old or how sick they were. The more they changed, the better they got at any age, which is a very empowering thing to be able to tell people. And they were two and a half times more what do we call cardiac events, heart attacks, strokes, bypasses, stents, and hospitalizations in the control group than in the group that made these lifestyle changes. Now, to put a human face on this, there was a documentary film two or three years ago called Escape Fire that featured our work in there. I'm going to show you an interview with one of the patients 25 years later talking about the kinds of changes he experienced. 25 years ago, I had five restaurants in San Francisco. It was a great life. I smoked six cigars a day, uh, 10 cups of coffee, a lot of wine. It was wonderful. And I had a massive heart attack. I was in the hospital for two weeks. I could hardly uh, just about walk three steps and I'd have to stop and rest. I was popping 20 or 30 nitrils a day. But then Dean Ornish was starting his program to see if you can reverse heart disease through lifestyle change. And he went to my doctor and asked if he could approach me. He told Dean, how long is the program? So he said it was a year. And my doctor told him uh, he wouldn't recommend taking me because he didn't think I would live the year. So he figured I was going to die because I was in such bad shape. And now, 25 years later, and I'm in pretty good shape. <laughs> his, uh, his doctor died during that year. That was uh, in the meantime, but that's another story. <laughs> so here's a guy who literally couldn't walk across the street without getting chest pain. He couldn't have sex. He couldn't work. He couldn't, you know, he, was, he couldn't take a, it took him an hour to take a shower. He hurt so bad. And within a, a few months, he was pain-free and has been now pain-free for the last 26, 27 years. That's why I'm so passionate about doing this work. And if we really understand, it's hard for many people to believe. You mean something as simple as what I eat and 
you know, exercise and meditating and having more love in my life is going to, you know, have these kinds of dramatic things. These are the things you normally associate with, you know, radical surgery, you know, cutting people's chest open or putting them on drugs for the rest of their lives. And yet, we found that we could do this. Here's one more. This is a guy from uh, West Virginia. We've trained 10 hospitals in West Virginia, which has been number one in the country in heart disease for the last 20 years. And uh, as Frank Sinatra used to sing, if I can make it in West Virginia, I can make it anywhere. So. I'm no longer using a cane or a wheelchair. In uh, November of 2001, I was using a cane to walk with, and I had to have the humiliating experience of riding a wheelchair around Walmart. Now, I didn't like that. I wasn't going to settle for that. I knew there must be a better way. And thank God I found a better way. I no longer have to take my diabetes medication. In fact, my total medication has been reduced by 75%. I had trouble getting to my mailbox uh, without having uh, chest pain. But uh, now I am walking at least two miles a day. I ride my stationary bike anywhere from eight to ten miles a day. And normally when you get put on these medications, you know, pills that control your blood pressure, your diabetes, your heart disease, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, etc. What do they tell you? How long do you have, they say, how long do I have to take these pills, doctor? And they say, forever, right? It's like, how long do I have to mop up the floor on the succinct that's overflowing? Well, forever. It's like, well, why don't we turn off the faucet? And when we do, which again, are the lifestyle choices that we make, then you hear stories like this over and over and over again. And it's really empowering for people to get off these medications, because if three or four times a day you're taking a pill, it reminds you that you're sick. You know, you have a chronic disease. When you can get off these medications under your doctor's supervision, which most people can, or at least dramatically reduce them, you begin to feel empowered. You feel strong. You feel like you're, you know, you're gaining your vitality back. And that's worth a lot. Now, we then looked at prostate cancer, as, as Dr. Williams mentioned. Prostate cancer is the number one cancer in men, other than skin cancer. Uh, if you're if 50 years old, you have a 50% chance of already having it. If you're 80 years old, you have an 80% chance of having it. And so we did a study with Peter Carroll, who's the chair of urology at UCSF, and Bill Fair, the late chair of urology at Sloan Kettering, one of the leading cancer institutions in the world. And we took men who had biopsy-proven prostate cancer, who had elected for reasons unrelated to the study not to be treated conventionally. So then we could look at the effects of lifestyle changes alone without being confounded with the usual chemo and radiation and surgery. And what we found is that PSA is a marker for prostate cancer. And the higher it goes, the greater the likelihood is that you have it, and the more um, it's progressing. And so then the red line, the control group, the comparison group, went up. They got worse during that year. But the group that in our program, then the green line, they went down. They got better. And those differences were highly significant. And we published that in the uh, leading urology journal. And here again, we found the more people changed, the more they improved. The low adherers, their PSA got worse. The high adherers, it came down. When we added their serum to a standard line of prostate tumor cells growing in tissue culture, we found that the, the tumor growth was inhibited 70% in the blue bar compared to only 9% in the control group. Huge differences. And in one of the coolest slides, we found that the more people change their lifestyle, the more it directly inhibited the growth of their cancer, which is pretty exciting. And you can see here there's a a new test called MRI spectroscopy that can look at the tumor activity shown in red, and you can see it shrinking from the beginning to a year later. So this was the first and still the only randomized trial showing that lifestyle changes alone can slow, stop, and even reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer. And what's true for prostate cancer is almost certainly going to be true for breast cancer as well, which we're also studying. And none of the people who went through our program during the first year needed surgery or radiation or chemo, but six of the control group patients did. Now, as I'll talk about, the side effects of the treatment are often worse than the disease because they, you end up in diapers because you're incontinent, you can't have sex because you're impotent, and only one out of 49 men actually benefits from the treatments. But if the choice is between doing nothing and doing something, most of you guys here like to do stuff, uh, and most of you women here like to do stuff if you have breast cancer. And so if the choice is between doing nothing and doing something, most people are going to do something even if it's not likely to help you and if it's, even if it's likely to maim you in the most personal ways. And so we'll come back to that. 
So we, looked, we were curious to know what the mechanisms might be to help explain this. So we looked at their gene expression. And what we found was that over 500 genes were changed. That when you change your lifestyle, it actually changes your genes. It turns on the genes that protect you. It turns off the genes that cause cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and lots of bad things. And um, we particularly found that what a subset of these oncogenes called RAS oncogenes were just turned off. This is in just three months. You could turn off hundreds of genes that cause cancer. Okay? This is what's called a heat map. Red is turned on on the left, and green is turned, on, on, or turned off on the right. And what you can see here is that it goes from mostly red to mostly green. And along the right here are all the different genes that control cancer. Just in three months, you can, you can turn off hundreds of genes that cause prostate, breast, and colon cancer. Meditation alone can actually um, change your gene expression. This was a study done at Harvard by Jeff Dusek. And at the top right, you can see red is turned on. These are the control group who weren't meditating. After just eight weeks of learning how to meditate, they were down-regulating the bad genes, and after long-term meditation, even more so. So there's a dose-response effect. Now, you know, we all know that exercise is good, and there's kind of a good macho quality to it. You gotta eat, it's just a question of what. But meditation, I don't know, that sounds kind of like a little touchy-feely and so on. How powerful could that be? Well, it's really powerful. In eight weeks of meditating, you can change hundreds of genes just from meditating, turning on the good ones, turning off the bad ones. Meditation is just practicing focusing your mind on one thing. And when you can focus energy, you gain power. You know, when we're all little, we have you know, a magnifying glass. You can focus the sun's rays, burn through a piece of paper. Or if you have a little brother, you can you know, torment them. Um, a laser is nothing more than just coherent light. The, light. the waveforms are all in sync, so you can burn through steel or you can bounce it off the moon. Mental energy is no different than any other kind of energy. Einstein's shown that all energy is interconvertible. And so when you can focus your awareness, you gain power. You can perform better on the battlefield, in the schoolroom, in the boardroom. You know, world-class athletes all meditate because at that level, at an elite level of athletics, the physical differences between athletes are pretty small. It's really a mental game, and it really gives you a competitive advantage. But it also quiets down your mind and body so you, can, you, you're, you get a, a more profound sense of relaxation than uh, even during deep sleep. And when you meditate, even a few minutes a day, people say things like, you know, I used to have a short fuse and I'd explode easily. Now my fuse is longer. Things don't bother me as much. So you can't always change the environment you're in, particularly in the military, because you're always getting sent different places. So if you have a way of making your fuse longer so you can be in the same environment but not react in the same way, that gives you a powerful advantage. And to the degree that you can teach your subordinates how to do that, uh, not only does it demonstrate that you really care about them, but you're giving them a powerful tool that can enable them to function under the most stressful situations at a much higher level. We then looked at the aging process itself. And as a, as a graphic example of what I'm just talking about, there's a, a doctor at UCSF, a professor named Elizabeth Blackburn. She got the Nobel Prize four years ago for discovering telomeres. Telomeres are the ends of our chromosomes that actually control how long we live. And as our telomeres get shorter, our lives get shorter, and the risk of premature death from pretty much everything goes up. So she did a study about, oh, 12 years ago, where she looked at women who were under chronic stress because they were taking care of parents with Alzheimer's or kids with autism. And she found the more stress they felt and the longer they reported feeling that way, the shorter their telomeres were. And she calculated the difference between the high stress and the low stress women was that the high stress women shorten their lifespan by nine to 17 years. That's a long time. But what I found most interesting about this study was that it wasn't an objective measure of stress that determined its effects. It was the women's perception. In other words, you could have two women in very comparable life situations. One was coping with it better. They were meditating, they were exercising, they had more love and support, they were eating better. And so it didn't affect them as much. And so even when we can't change our environment, we can change how we react to it. And that's especially important. The more austere and, and hostile the environment you're in, the people who can really keep their cool and center are the ones who are more likely to survive because you can make better decisions. So we were at a conference together, and I said, you know, if bad things make your telomeres shorter, maybe good things make them longer. So we did a study, and we found that the enzyme, the telomerase, increased by 30% in just three months, again, showing how dynamic this is. And last year, we published the first study showing we could actually lengthen the telomeres by about 10% showing the blue bar going up, whereas the control group, they got shorter. 
So this is actually reversing aging at a cellular level. And now that I'm 96, you know, I'm, I'm more interested in this. <clears throat> I look pretty good for 96. Somebody said, yeah, you don't look a day over 95. Um, and the more people change, the longer their telomeres got. Again, the, at any age. So it's never too late to begin making these changes. So our genes are a predisposition, but our genes are not our fate. And so often I hear people say things like, oh, you know, I've got bad genes. There's nothing I can do about it. Well, it turns out there's a lot you can do about it. Not to blame, but to empower. Because if you're just a victim of bad genes, then you're a victim. And this group doesn't strike me as a group that likes to be victims, right? You can take control of your lives in a much greater degree and much faster than we had once realized. We then looked at something called angiogenesis. When tumors grow, they secrete substances that cause blood vessels to grow to feed the tumors. Because they grow so quickly, they outstrip the blood supply otherwise. And if you can disrupt the blood supply, it's a little like disrupting the supply line in a, in a, in a war zone. You can kill the tumor with a lot less toxicity than killing the tumor directly. And there are drugs that can do that, like Avastin, Nexavar, others. But they're over $100,000 $100, per year per person to take. We found that we could downregulate. VEGF is one of the things that tumors secrete to cause blood vessels to grow to feed them. And you can see red is the control group, meaning they were secreting a lot of this thing that causes blood vessels to grow to feed them. But the blue and the people who made these lifestyle changes, it was 80% lower. So you can accomplish the same goal as these drugs, but again, without the costs and the side effects. <clears throat> we found that we could reverse type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is epidemic. It's pandemic, actually. It's around the world. You know, a third of Americans today either are diabetic or pre-diabetic. And it's, it's supposed to be half of Americans in the next five years at a cost of over $3 trillion. That's not sustainable. Now, what's interesting is that Lifestyle changes are actually better than drugs at preventing diabetes. This was a study where they looked at lifestyle and they compared it to a drug, metformin, or a placebo. And they found that lifestyle changes were better than the drug at preventing type 2 diabetes. And more recently, we've learned that lifestyle changes are better than drugs at treating people with type 2 diabetes. This was a study that came out where they found that they gave people two drugs to get their blood sugar down. They got the blood sugar down, thinking that would prevent the horrible complications of diabetes, but actually they made it worse. And, the, and yet, if you can get your blood sugar down with lifestyle, without the drugs, you can prevent all of the complications. And the complications of diabetes are awful, any one of which would be awful, but in aggregate are truly awful. You know, heart disease, blindness, amputations, kidney damage, impotence, and so on. But if you get your hemoglobin A1C, which is just an average blood sugar down below 7, according to the American Diabetes Association, you can prevent all of these complications. And that's just what we found. We, in, in, three, in three states where we train, West Virginia, Nebraska, and Pennsylvania, we got their hemoglobin A1Cs from above 7 to below 7 after uh, just 12 weeks, and it remained below 7 after a year. And I thought it might be worth taking a moment to say, what have we learned about what enables people to make sustainable changes? Because it's not what I thought when I began doing this. I used to try to scare people into changing, right? And, and I, I thought, if I could just make it scary enough, then people will stop smoking or whatever. I don't know if you've ever been to, uh, like, a duty-free store in the United Kingdom. I mean, here, you, know, you, you see the warnings on the side of cigarettes, you know, smoking causes death and cancer. But in the UK, they have these graphic pictures of people, you know, with half their faces removed or tracheotomies, thinking if we could just make it scary enough, nobody will smoke. But it doesn't work that way. In the short run, fear is really powerful. It's visceral, you know. It, it stimulates the part of your brain, the amygdala, that really causes you to really uh, have the fight or flight response. But what's really sustainable is not fear of dying, it's joy of living. If it's fun, if it makes you feel good, if you have a sense of freedom of choice, and if you have a sense of love and support, that's what makes it sustainable. But the whole concept of risk factor reduction and even prevention is often fear-based. You know, don't smoke that cigarette, you're gonna get lung cancer. Put that burger down, you're gonna get a heart attack. And so maybe for like, Six weeks after someone's had a heart attack, they'll do pretty much anything the doctor or nurse tells them to do. But even then, they go back to their old ways, because I've just learned that fear is not a sustainable motivator. It's not, and, and I'll talk about this later and how that relates to, to combat. But it's not true in politics. It's not true in medicine. In the short run, it'll really get your attention. I mean, let's take global warming. You know, When Al Gore started talking about global warming, everybody said, wow, you know, let's do something about it. And now it's like, ah, you know, who cares? It's so far in the future. And it's so scary to think that the whole planet may get, you know, implode. It's like, who wants to think about it so you don't? So fear is really hard to sustain. And this is an old idea. This goes back to the first dietary intervention that failed, you know, when, uh, 
when God said, don't eat the apple, and that didn't go so well, right? And uh, if you tell teenagers that, um, you know, smoking is dangerous, not only is it not helpful, it's actually counterproductive. It just makes it cool, you know, like James Dean on a Harley or something. And I love this cartoon. She says, I give smokers a discount because there's not as much to tell. Uh, that doesn't work so well. Now, the idea that taking a pill is easy and everyone will do it, but changing diet and lifestyle is difficult, if not impossible, is really not what we're finding. The drug company's own data show that two-thirds of the people who are prescribed cholesterol-lowering drugs like statins, like Lipitor, aren't taking them just after like six months or so. And statins are a proven value. But why is that? Even if someone else pays for it, even if they don't have side effects, most people aren't taking it after just a few months. And the answer is because they're fear-based. Take this pill. It's not going to make you feel better. Hopefully, it won't make you feel worse. It prevents something really awful like a heart attack or stroke that you don't want to think about, so you don't. So people stop taking it. But the paradox is we're getting 85 to 90 percent adherence to our lifestyle program in some of the most challenging parts of the country. Uh, way harder to change your lifestyle than to take a pill, and yet people are doing it. Why? Because the pill doesn't make you feel better, but the lifestyle changes do. And that's the key. You know, there's no point in giving up something that you really like unless you get something back that's better and quickly. And because these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic, most people find they feel so much better so quickly, it reframes the reason for making these changes from fear of dying, which is not sustainable, to joy of living, which is. When you eat healthier, when you manage stress, when you exercise, when you have more love and support in your life, your brain gets more blood. You think more clearly. You have more energy. You need less sleep. The newest studies, what's called neurogenesis or neuroplasticity, is that your brain can grow so many new brain neurons in just a few weeks that your brain can actually get measurably bigger. You know, that was thought in part. When I was in medical school, you know, we were taught if you went and had a couple six packs and you killed off a few thousand neurons, you know, you never got them back. The good news is you can, you can actually regrow them, and particularly in the parts of your brain that you want to get your brain to get bigger, like in what's called the hippocampus that controls memory. And many of you are probably getting old enough to start like, like, where did I put my keys, you know, and what's the name of that guy? You know, I know it's right on the tip of my tongue. You can reverse a lot of that by making these same lifestyle changes. So yeah, you live longer, but even more importantly, the quality of your life, you live better. Just walking a half an hour a day was enough to cause so much neurogenesis that people's brains got bigger in just three months. You know, that's not a lot. Uh, as people get older, our population, all the baby boomers are now getting older, and those over 65, just eating more vegetables can reduce the risk of dementia by 38%. You know, if, there, if a new drug could do that, everybody would be taking it, but it's just eating more vegetables. Uh, you can uh, double the risk of Alzheimer's if you eat a lot of uh, saturated fat and trans fats. So what's bad for your heart is bad for your brain. But what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Some of my favorite things like chocolate and tea and blueberries actually promote neurogenesis, whereas saturated fat and sugar and nicotine are not only bad for your heart, they, they decrease neurogenesis. Moderate alcohol increases it too much, decreases it, and so on. So these gets away from the sense of deprivation and more to the sense of abundance. Uh, even sex, believe it or not, can uh, increase neurogenesis. So if you need to quote me on that later, I'll be happy to write you a doctor's note. We'll just <coughs> <coughs> Your skin gets more blood, so you don't age as quickly. You know, when people smoke cigarettes, they, their, their nicotine makes your arteries constrict. Okay? And so in your in your brain, that can cause a stroke. In your heart, it can cause a heart attack. But in your skin, it makes you age. You look 20 or 30 years older. Okay, it gives you that kind of great pallor. Uh, and uh, Christy Turlington, the uh, supermodel's father died of lung cancer. So she has this wonderful website called smokingisugly.com to get away from making smoking cool to make it not so cool. And it turns out that half of guys who smoke are impotent, even in their 20s or 30s, okay? Because Viagra dilates your blood vessels, nicotine constricts them. And so one of the most effective anti-smoking ads was done by the Department of Health Services. They hired a guy, dressed him up like the Marlboro Man, had these big billboards that looked like, oh, sorry, uh, look like this, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> you notice the uh, limp cigarette there. But the headline, it doesn't say emphysema, heart disease, stroke. Those are too scary. That's the fear-based approach. It puts it right into the here and now. So if you tell somebody smoking you know, is dangerous, that makes it cool. If you say smoking makes you ugly and impotent, that's not cool. And so it really reframes that. It makes it much more effective. Um, and in all of our studies, we found the more you change, the more you improve. I mean, that's important because you know, at any age, I thought, that, again, the younger people would do better. But 
it was the same if we were 86 as if you're 26. And I came up with this idea called the spectrum, which was based on the idea that the more you change, the better you get. You know, if you go on a diet, you're going to go off a diet sooner or later, because diets are all about what you can't have and what you must do. And even more than being healthy, I found that people want to feel free and in control. And as soon as I tell a patient, you know, eat this, don't eat that, do this, go do that, they kind of hunch up their shoulders and they walk out of my office and they immediately want to do just the opposite. I imagine most of you don't like people telling you what to do, right? And nobody does. It's just human nature. So, and then when you get off the diet, you feel like you failed, and then you have all those, you know, toxic emotions of shame and guilt and anger and humiliation, which really are bad for you. So that's no good. And so, and, and so I, I chaired um, at Google. They had this thing called Google Health that I chaired for uh, three years at, from uh, 2007 to 2009 with Marissa Meyer before she went on to become the CEO of Yahoo. And we were trying to come up with these really complex algorithms for personalizing a lifestyle recommendation. We're plugging in all of your genetic testing and your questionnaires and all this and that. And one day I said, you know, I think we're going about this in completely the wrong way. I don't know if you ever have those moments of insight where you go, you know, this is, this is not working. I said, why don't we, instead of making this so complicated, let's make it radically simple. Because even if we came up with these algorithms, it's still me telling you what you should be doing, then there's always that pushback. But instead of me telling you what you should be doing, how about you, the patient, tell me what you want to do? And how much? And to what degree? And we'll support that degree of change. And, and instead of calling foods good or bad, as soon as you call this a bad food, then it's a very small step to saying I'm a bad person because I eat bad food. You know, I, you know, I can't go out to dinner without people apologizing for what they're eating and commenting. I say, you know, I'm not the food police. You know, whatever you want to do is fine. But still, there's this whole moralistic quality around food, and it's not helpful. So I, what I did is to say food is just food, but some foods are healthier than others. So I categorize foods from the most healthy, what I call group one, to the least healthy, group five, and say what matters most is your overall way of eating and living. Now, if you've got heart disease and you want to reverse it, or prostate cancer, then you need to be eating pretty healthy all the time. But for most people, it's the average of what you do. If you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you cheated or you failed or you're bad. Just eat healthier the next. If you forget to exercise one day, do a little more the next. You don't have time to meditate for an hour, do it for a minute. You know, whatever you do, there's a corresponding benefit. And then, Instead of me telling you what to do, you decide how much to change. We'll support it. We'll track it. And if that degree of change is enough to accomplish your goals, great. If not, you can do more. It's radically simple. So I'm just going to play you a 90-second video that kind of encapsulates that. <laughs> simple. Um, I thought it might be worth taking a moment to talk about what I think is, a, is an optimal way of eating, because there's been so much controversy around that. But it's, it's really not that hard. You really want to eat, to the degree you can eat more plants, you're going to be healthier. Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, soy products, in their natural forms. Plants are low in the substances that cause disease, and there's literally hundreds of thousands of substances that protect you and prevent and heal disease. What you include in your diet is as important as what you exclude, as we've been talking about. And you want to try to eat as close as possible in its natural form. The more processed it is, the less healthy it is. 
You want to reduce your intake of fat, particularly what are called trans fats, which make your, the shelf life of the products longer, but they decrease your shelf life. Um, and particularly want to reduce your intake of sugar and what are called refined carbohydrates, things like white flour and white rice. If you can move to things like uh, whole wheat flour and brown rice and try to reduce the amount of sugar. Um, and you want to have four grams a day of fish oil, which you can buy in any, any health food store or uh, pharmacy. The, the fish oil can reduce your risk of a heart attack by up to 80% of sudden cardiac death. And if you're a pregnant woman uh, or a breastfeeding woman, you can raise your baby's IQ 7 to 10 points just by that alone. So, and you can kind of make them able to focus and, and uh, be more, more um, uh, calm in what they're doing. And if you can afford organic, it not only tastes better, but it's a lot better for you. Now, the reason that sugar is a problem is that when you go from, say, whole wheat flour to, brown, to uh, white flour, from brown rice to white rice, you're removing the fiber in the bran. And ordinarily, that fills you up before you get too many calories. And it slows the rate of absorption of the food from your gut into your blood. So if you're eating a lot of sugar or white flour, your blood sugar zooms up. You're like mainlining. It goes straight into your bloodstream. So your blood sugar zooms up. Your pancreas senses that your blood sugar is too high, so it secretes insulin, which brings your blood sugar back down, which is good. But insulin has lots of bad effects that accelerate the conversion of calories into fat. They increase inflammation, which is an underlying substrate for many chronic diseases. And uh, yet, when you eat whole wheat flour or brown rice or fruits and vegetables in their natural form, the fiber slows the absorption. It fills you up before you get too many calories, so you lose weight without being hungry. And it's, the fiber slows the rate of absorption from your gut into your blood. So instead of getting these spikes in blood sugar that provoke an insulin response, it's more of a constant source of energy throughout the day. And it'll give you more energy without those peaks and valleys. And so it's important. And it's not, you know, low carb versus low fat. You know, there's been, there's, uh, there's uh, the cover of Time magazine uh, a few months ago said, you know, we're all, we're all wrong. Everybody should eat butter, you know, eat more fat, you know, eat more junk. And I'd love to be able to tell you that's true. It doesn't mean you should never eat it, but it's not a health food. And it's based on the myth that Americans have been told to eat less fat. They're fatter than ever, so clearly fat's not the problem. Well, the problem is, is that Americans have been told to eat less fat, but are they eating less fat? When I actually went to the US Department of Agriculture database, what I learned is that we're eating more fat than ever. Every decade since 1950, We've been eating more fat, more sugar, more calories, and more meat. So it's not surprising that Americans are fatter, and not just Americans, but most countries in the world now, because I know many of you from like 60 some odd different countries. This is a, a global issue. And so um, it's not surprising why people are overweight. Now, it's not even just carbs versus fat. There was, this is a really important study that came out in March of this year. And they found that the, the source of the protein is actually incredibly important. If it's plant-based protein, it doesn't harm you and it, may, and it protects you. But if it's animal-based protein, like from red meat, people who ate a lot of animal protein had a 75% higher risk of premature death from all causes, a 400% increased risk of premature death from cancer, and a 500% increase from diabetes. Those are not small numbers. And so to the degree you can move towards a plant-based diet, it doesn't mean that everybody here is going to be vegetarian. I, I don't have any illusions about that. But to the degree you move in that direction, you're going to be doing one of the most important things you can to enhance your health and your performance. The cartoon says, my only consolation is that by eating us, they're killing themselves. A little dark humor. Uh, <laughs> now, what's, there was a study that came out last week that said low carb was better than low fat because the, the, uh, they lost a little more weight and the cholesterol levels weren't that different. But what's important to look at in these studies isn't just what happens to these risk factors. Like cholesterol is not a disease. It's just a a risk for disease. If your cholesterol is high, your risk of clogged arteries is greater. But if you actually look at what happens in the arteries, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. They found that on, a, on the top picture, on a diet like we've been talking about, a healthy diet, there isn't clogging in the arteries. The middle picture is a typical American diet, which is partially clogged. And the third is a high-protein, low-carb Atkins type diet, which is severely clogged. And I debated Dr. Atkins you know, dozens of times before he died. And that didn't come out right, did it? Uh, <laughs> maybe it did, actually. Um, and he was always saying that, uh, you know, Atkins diet is good for your heart. But when you actually measure what happens in the arteries, even though the arteries are more clogged, the cholesterol levels weren't that different. So it's mediated through other things, things like endothelial progenitor cells and 
free fatty acids and IGF-1 and things like that that most people have never heard of. And so it's important when you're looking at what are the effects of different diets, not just to look at the intermediaries, but to look at the actual arteries, and this is what you find. And how you eat is as important as what you eat. You know, if you can eat mindfully, paying attention to what you eat, you can get more pleasure with fewer calories because you're enjoying it more. I mean, every, I, I've certainly had the experience, I bet you have too, where you're watching a really interesting, powerful movie, and you know, you're kind of eating popcorn while you're watching it, and you know, I don't know, White House down, whatever it is, and you're kind of immersed in it, and suddenly you look down the bag, the popcorn's empty, it's like, who ate this? Has that ever happened to you? you know? So you got all the calories, but you really weren't enjoying it because you weren't paying attention to it. So when you eat something, really focus your awareness on it, and then you can get more pleasure with fewer calories without feeling deprived. Um, we've been training the uh, St. Vincent de Paul homeless shelter in our program in San Francisco. Uh, we've now trained over 30,000 homeless people who've gone through these programs. So it's not just for affluent, educated people. This is for everyone. And now that Medicare is covering our program, we're expanding that to homeless shelters around the country. Many of you, as I mentioned, are from other countries, and you've seen this happening. There's what I call a globalization of chronic disease as other countries are starting to eat like us and live like us and all too often die like us. You know, more people are dying from uh, uh, heart disease and diabetes than AIDS, TB, and malaria combined throughout Asia and even most of Africa. Now, what's really ironic about all this is that the diet that we found that we've been talking about that's so healthy that can prevent and reverse all these chronic diseases is the way most people were eating before they started to copy our way of eating. So we've been exporting our chronic diseases around the world, and we can reverse that if we take a different approach. And it's because it's diverting a lot of resources away from things that really do require drugs, like AIDS, TB, and malaria, to things that can be largely prevented and reversed simply by changing lifestyle. And there's a larger issue, too. What's good for you is good for the planet. What's personally sustainable is globally sustainable. Many people, you know, there's, there are three major crises that we all deal with every day, the energy crisis, the global warming crisis, and the health crisis. And where they all intersect is around food. Because it's so easy to just go, oh, my God, what can I do as one person about all this stuff? And when we know that the choices that we make each day and something as fundamental as what we eat can make such a difference in all three of these crises, it makes those choices more meaningful. And as I'll talk about later, if it's meaningful, then it's sustainable. From an energy, energy crisis, we spend 20% of our energy just processing foods to make it unhealthy, you know, which isn't a smart choice on both fronts. And it takes 10 times more energy to eat a meat-based diet than it does a plant-based diet. Because when you get all that protein, it's going to the whole food chain before it ends up in the the cow or whatever it is that you're eating. Does that mean you should never eat meat? I'm not saying that. But to the degree you move in that direction, have a meatless Monday or whatever, it'll, it'll be good for your body, but it's also good for the planet. From a global warming standpoint, most people were, are really surprised to learn that more global warming is caused by eating livestock than all forms of transportation combined. You know, you can drive a, a, a Hummer and be a vegan and do less damage to the environment than driving a Prius and eating meat, as it turns out. It's, uh, uh, trans the the uh, uh, livestock consumption is at least 18% of global warming, and, and the most recent studies say it's 50%, whereas the entire global transportation system only accounts for 13% of global warming. So these things make a difference. And from a health crisis, three quarters of the $2.8 trillion that we spend on health care in this country is to treat chronic disease, it's really a sick care, not health care, or to treat chronic diseases like heart disease and diabetes and things we've been talking about that can be largely prevented or reversed by simply changing diet and lifestyle. I mean, we have this gridlock in Washington now, as many of you know, between many Democrats saying, let's just raise taxes, let the deficit go up, many Republicans saying, let's just you know, privatize or dismantle Medicare. Not a lot of, of common ground there. We're saying, wait a minute, there's a third alternative. We turn off that faucet around the sink that's overflowing, then we can make better care available to more Americans at much lower cost. And again, the only side effects are good ones. The cartoon says, the surgeon says, I can operate, or you can go on a strict diet, and the patient says, well, you better operate because my insurance doesn't cover a strict diet, and that's been the problem. And so, as I mentioned before, um, we spent a lot of money last year, almost $80 billion, on doing bypass surgery and angioplasty. And you say, well, that's a lot of money, but think of all the lives it saved, except it doesn't. They don't work. The, the, the meta-analyses have shown that, and this is from the New England Journal of Medicine and the Archives of Internal Medicine, they found that Angioplasties and stents, unless you're in the middle of having a heart attack, which most people aren't, the angioplasties and stents, they don't prolong life, they don't prevent heart attacks, they don't even reduce chest pain. And the same is true for bypass surgery. Unless you have the most severe disease, one or two percent of people, they don't work either. So we pay 
tens of billions of dollars for things that are you know, dangerous, invasive, expensive, and, and largely ineffective. And as I mentioned earlier, only one out of 49 men who has prostate cancer benefits from the surgery or radiation. What happens to the other 48? Well, as I mentioned, um, New England Journal of Medicine, after 15 years, almost everybody's impotent. They can't have sex. Or they're incontinent. They're, they're wearing diapers. Now, most of you are pretty macho guys here. That's why you're here. Imagine wearing diapers for the rest of your life or not being able to have sex. And worst of all, you could have avoided it 48 out of 49 times because it wouldn't have helped you. That's not a good trade-off at a huge economic cost on top of all that. So it maims you in the most personal ways for no benefit. The US Preventive Services Task Force said, maybe we shouldn't even be screening men for prostate cancer because there's such intense pressure when you find out you've got prostate cancer to quote, do something about it. If it's a choice between doing nothing and doing something, most of you are very actively involved people, you're gonna to wanna to do something. But if the something is only gonna benefit you one out of 49 times and maim you the other 48 times, that's not a good choice. So we can offer a third alternative, which is a, an aggressive, non-surgical, non-pharmacologic intervention that not only can help stop and reverse your prostate cancer, because most people are gonna be dying with prostate cancer rather than from prostate cancer. So for those of you who have been diagnosed with it or if you have a PSA that's elevated and your doctor tells you you need surgery, make sure you get another opinion because most people don't. Um, we've done three demonstration projects. The first, we found that most people who were told they needed bypass surgery could safely avoid it. And Mutual of Omaha found they saved almost $30,000 per patient in the first year. Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield found when they looked at their healthcare costs compared to a comparable group of patients, they were the same at the beginning in the first two bars, but after year one, they were 50% lower in the group that made these changes. So you can imagine if we're spending $2.8 trillion on healthcare and we can cut that in half in the first year, that's a lot of money left over to pay for things in the military, for the infrastructure, for education, for schools, for all kinds of things that we could do or just bring the deficit down. And when they looked at the people who they'd spent the most money on in the preceding year, if they spent at least $25,000 in the preceding year, the following year they cut their costs by 400%. So again, turning off the faucet is not only medically effective, it's also cost effective. And we found improvements in every metric when we looked at all these patients over the course of the year. I'm just gonna run through these fairly quickly. We found a 16 pound average weight loss. Uh, this is better than Weight Watchers, but we're not focusing on weight, we're focusing on health. And when you focus on health, everything gets better. You can lose weight in ways that are not necessarily good for your health, like an Atkins diet, or smoking cigarettes is a good way to lose weight, or chemotherapy is a good way to lose weight, but it's not a very healthy way to lose weight. Angina or chest pain fell. These are all beginning 12 weeks, one year. You can see the pattern. Um, and almost all the patients reported significant improvements, like the guys on the two videos that you first saw. Ability to exercise goes up quickly and stays up. Uh, you know the old joke, am I going to live longer? Is it just going to seem longer if I change my lifestyle? Um, your quality of life improves dramatically. The systolic blood pressure goes down. Diastolic blood pressure goes down. Most people can get off these medications they were told they'd have to take. Their blood sugars go down and stay down. This is particularly interesting because the depression scores are cut almost in half. And this is particularly important in the military for reasons I'll talk about in just a moment. This works better than antidepressants without the costs and side effects. That's actually how I got interested in doing this work. I was suicidally depressed when I was in college because I thought I was stupid and that I just managed to fool people into thinking that I was smart. And now that I was in college with a bunch of really smart people, there was just a matter of time before they figured out what a mistake they'd made in letting me in. I bet you anything, some of you have felt that way before. Uh, and, and, and having survived that, that's really was my doorway into learning about all this stuff. Now, Medicare, as Colonel Williams mentioned, is. Now covering our program, it's the first time Medicare's done that, so we're, and now that Medicare's covering it, most of the other insurance companies are. So we're really trying to create a new whole paradigm of healthcare that's based around implementing these processes in ways that make it much more fun to go to the doctor, makes it more fun to practice medicine, and saves a lot of money and improves health at the same time. And recently they're broadening the coverage to include those with diabetes and, and early stage prostate cancer for the reasons we've been talking about. And if it's reimbursable, then it's sustainable. Our model is a team approach. A physician is quarterback, and he or she works with a nurse, a, a dietitian, a, a stress management specialist, an exercise physiologist, and a psychologist. Medicare pays for 72 hours of training, so we divide that into 18 four-hour sessions. Each session, people get an hour of exercise, an hour of stress management, which is essentially meditation and yoga, an hour of a support group, and an hour of a lecture with a group meal. 
Now, and also for those of us who are healthcare professionals, allow us to get out of just being technicians and more into what we went into medicine for in the first place. If you go to our website, uh, ornish.com, all, all the studies I've quoted, there's recipes, menus, guided meditations, there's an online support group, it's all free. And by the way, just as a, as a courtesy to you all, if you have any questions that we don't have time to, uh, to deal with later, if you send me a personal email and put Army War College in the subject heading, I promise I will eventually, not necessarily right away, answer you and keep it confidential. My email is just dean at pmri.org, stands for Preventive Medicine Research Institute. Dean or dean.ornish, either way will get to me, dean at pmri.org. I'm happy to do that. Now, as I mentioned, when people are depressed, it doesn't just affect the quality of their lives, it affects their survival. And not just a little, but a lot. People who are lonely and depressed are three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community. You know, it's more than any other factor in medicine, more than your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your weight, anything is depression. Now, clearly information is not enough. Telling somebody who's depressed that they're gonna live longer if they just quit smoking or change their diet is not that motivating. They're just trying to get through the day. And they'll say things like, you, you don't get it. You know, I say, what, you know, why? Why do you do these things? Why do you smoke and overeat and drink too much and work too hard and abuse yourself? These behaviors seem so maladaptive. They say, you don't get it, Dean. These behaviors are very adaptive because they help us deal with our pain. They help us get through the day. They say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is. You gonna take away my 20 friends? What are you gonna give me? Or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain or food fills that void or alcohol or other drugs numb the pain or working all the time numbs the pain or Video games numb the pain, you know, whatever it is. We have lots of ways of numbing or distracting ourselves from that pain, but the pain's not the problem. The pain's the messenger. It's saying, hey, listen up, pay attention. You're not doing something that's in your best interest. And if we just kill or numb the pain without listening to it, it's like clipping the wires to a fire alarm while your house is burning and going back to sleep saying, well, we just did something great. Except you just killed the messenger. You're not really doing, again, what is the underlying cause? And so when you're in pain, though, the opportunity is that just as it was for me when I was so depressed, is you're open to new ideas. It's kind of like, oh, that stuff seems so weird, you know, meditation and eating vegetables and all stuff, but boy, I'm hurting so bad, let me try this weird stuff. And then when the pain goes away, like the guys on the video, it's kind of like, oh, okay, when I do this, I feel good. When I do that, I don't feel so good, so maybe I'll do more of this and less of that, not because some doctor or some authority told you, but because you realize it from your own experience. So we need to work at a deeper level. Just for example, six months after a heart attack, those who were depressed were four times more likely to be dead than those who weren't. That's pretty significant. And the reason why this all comes to bear in the military is last year, or two years ago actually, I started talking about the power of love at the Army War College, which always seemed a little bit of a contradiction, except it's not. Um, because more people have died from suicide in the last 40 years than in, in combat. In, in all the wars we fought in the last 40 years. That's pitiful, you know? And, and it's often the best and the brightest who are, who are doing themselves in. You know, one veteran kills themselves every hour, 24 hours a day around the world, one US veteran. One active duty soldier kills themselves every day, 365 days a year. Think about that for a minute, okay? And it doesn't have to be that way. So. I just, when, I, when I decided I'd give a talk on the power of love of the Army War College, I figured I'd have no street cred at all, uh, being the wuss California doctor talking about this stuff. So I asked um, General uh, Stan McChrystal, who's a good friend, if he would make a short video, because I figured he would have a lot more street cred than I would. And so I'm gonna play this little video that he made, which is, I think is really uh, inspiring. I'll just bring it up here. Hi, I'm Stan McChrystal, and thanks for being here today. In fact, I wanna thank Dean for letting me be here today. This is the second time I've been able to participate from afar into what I think is his discussion of a really important subject. You know, we're gonna to talk today about the power of love. Soldiers love things, they love their truck, they love their dog, they love their kids, they love their wife. But as I grew up as a soldier, it was really uncommon to talk about loving what you do or loving other soldiers. But if you think about why people do extraordinary things, why on the battlefield soldiers will sacrifice themselves, why they will make extraordinary efforts not to let down the comrade on their left or right, it's got nothing to do with fear of co or coercion from their corporal or their sergeant or officers. 
It has everything to do with commitment and wanting to have a relationship with people and with an organization in which they feel like they've given part of themselves so that they can, in fact, feel like they are a very important part of that team. So when we talk about the power of love, I think it's the most powerful things that move soldiers. Again, you're not going to stand in the sports bar and talk about how much you love each other. I love you, man. But when people put it on, the equipment, when they really have got to do difficult things, I think that's what makes people operate. I think that's what makes people give. And I think that's what makes organizations strong. Thank you, Dean. All the best. It kind of goes back to what we were saying before about fear is not a sustainable motivator. You can try to manage through fear and intimidation, and it works a little bit, but you can't scare people as much as somebody shooting at them, you know? And if that's all you got, it's not going to be enough. But if they love you, they will die for you. And so these touchy-feely, you know, when people used to, when I started doing this work, other scientists would say, oh, that's so touchy-feely, you know? And I'd say, no, 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 it's really hard science, and I'd just talk about all these graphs and data and so on. And then one day I thought, you know, it is touchy-feely. That's what makes it work. We are touchy-feely creatures. We are creatures of love and community. That's what sustained us as a species. That's what's enabled us to survive all these years. You know, all these studies show that when you're lonely and isolated and depressed, you're three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely, as we talked about. And there's been a radical shift in our culture in the last 50 years. You know, many people don't have a, a stable neighborhood where you had two or three generations of people that grew up together like 50 years ago, or a church or synagogue people go to regularly, or a a job that you've been at for 20 or 30 years, or a, an extended family, or often even a nuclear family that you see regularly. And, but these are the most powerful things. We tend to think that the time we spend with our friends and family is what you do after you've done all the important stuff. But it is the important stuff. And so I would encourage each of you, if you don't remember anything else we've talked about today, that when you're in a commanding situation and you've got subordinates that, particularly in battle, is spend that little extra time asking how they're doing, letting them know that you love and care for them. What's going on in their families? What's going on at home? What's going on with the spouse that's been left behind? What's going on with the kids? You know, you know how are they feeling? You know, the more you can make them feel loved, not as a pretense, but as, a, as an authentic feeling, the more you can make them feel loved and cared about and nurtured and supported, the more you're likely to survive and the more you're going to get the best out of someone, whether it's on the, in combat or whether in in the boardroom and working, or you have a team of people you're trying to solve a difficult problem, they will go that extra mile for you if you're able to do that. Now, to, just to show you how interconnected we are, uh, Nicholas Christakis at Harvard found that if we're so interconnected that if your friends are obese, not surprisingly, you're 45% more likely to be obese yourself. If your friend's friends are obese, it's 25%. And if it's your friend's friend's friends, you're 10% more likely to be obese, even if you've never met them. That's how much we influence each other. <laughs> Think about that for a minute. And it's not just obesity, it's everything. You know? That's how we're, we are creatures of community. We've lost that. And again, part of the, the first step in healing is awareness. And as we understand how important these factors are, we can do things differently. It makes a difference. Just as one of many examples I could show you, uh, David Spiegel at Stanford Medical School took women with metastatic breast cancer, and he randomly divided them into two groups. Both groups got the same you know, chemo, radiation, and surgery, but in addition, one group of, of women met together for an hour and a half once a week to talk about what it's really like having breast cancer, you know, metastatic breast cancer, where you're about to die, in a safe and loving environment. He just did that for a year. Five years later, he told me he almost fell off his chair when he looked at these data. Those women live in the blue line live twice as long as the other women, and that was the only difference. Now, I understand that some of you might say, oh, please, you know, give me a break. You know, sitting around talking about my feelings is going to help me live longer if I've got cancer. Come on, please. But that's what the data show. We are creatures of community. So when you can create an environment in the work environment that you're in, whether it's in the battlefield or whether it's in whatever you're doing, where it feels safe enough for people to express feelings, which are really what connect us, and to be authentic and, and have that sense of integrity that comes with being authentic, it's incredibly motivating. And even you know, when you're at death's door, it can help you stay alive. It's, it's really powerful. Now, intimacy is healing. But you know, even the word healing comes from the root to make whole, yoga, to yoke, to unite, to bring together. These are very, in a way, old ideas that we're rediscovering. 
But you can only be intimate with someone to the degree you can open up and let them in and be vulnerable. But you can only be vulnerable to the extent that you have a trusting environment. Because otherwise, you know, it's like everybody's opened up and gotten hurt. It's like, like I don't want to do that again. So to the degree that you can create an ethos or a culture of trust and, and, and loving kindness and openness and intimacy, you're going to get the best out of the people that you command. And it makes it a lot more fun to, to have those kinds of things. Um, and so if it feels good, it's sustainable. And if it's fun and you feel free, it's sustainable. And if it's meaningful, it's sustainable. And if you feel loved, it's sustainable. And also, it just makes it a lot more fun. It's not just how long we live, but how well we live. And, you know, in a larger sense, it's like, why have any limitations if you don't have to, if no one's watching? You know, like, why not have sex with everybody? Why not eat anything you want? If nobody's watching, you can afford it. Um, and, and all spiritual traditions have, for example, dietary guidelines that, you know, except they're all different from each other. And one, you can eat this, but not that, or in certain times of year, or after midnight, but not before, or whatever. It's like, what is this? You know, is, every, is God confused? And I think that whatever the intrinsic benefit, that just choosing not to do something that you otherwise could do imbues it with great meaning. You know, I'm choosing not to eat certain foods so that I can live long enough to watch my kid graduate or whatever it happens to be. You know, the, and that makes it sacred in the sense of the most special. You know, not in this kind of dry, button, you know, boring, musty, moldy kind of thing, but the most special, the most fun, the most erotic, the most intimate, the most exciting, the most powerful, the most ecstatic, really. There's a hundred years ago, there was a South Indian philosopher named Ramakrishna. He said, you can dig a, you know, a lot of shallow wells and never reach water. You can dig one deep one and reach the wellspring. It's like, why be, so the idea, you could say being in a committed monogamous relationship is kind of boring. It's the ball and chain, or that's what enables me to feel safe and secure enough to continue to open up enough to really have a level of intimacy that's just thrilling, you know, that makes it so much more fun. If you say, I feel deprived because I can't eat that, that's not sustainable. If you say, I'm choosing not to eat certain foods because what I gain is so much more than what I give up, that's sustainable. And if it's meaningful, then it's sustainable. And that's the antithesis of depression. I've been working with President Clinton since 1993. Uh, we've, we trained the White House chefs, the Camp David chefs, the Air Force One chefs, the Navy Mess chefs that, that cook for him. And then when his uh, bypass is clogged up about five years ago, I began putting him on a much more, basically the, the whole foods plant-based diet we've been talking about. And I said, why do you want to do this? In fact, I had dinner with, with him and uh, Hillary Clinton last night, and we were talking about these things uh, at their home in Washington. And I said, why, wh you know, what's it like? He said, well, I did this because I wanted to see my daughter, I wanted to walk my daughter down the aisle, and I wanted to see my first grandkid. And, his, you know, he walked her down the aisle, and his grandkid's going to be born any day now. And... Uh, that's what makes it sustainable. You know, not to prevent something bad from happening, but because it enables you to, to do something that's really joyful and meaningful. On the other end of the spectrum are the concentration camps in World War II. You know, um, there was a classic book that many of you may have read called Man's Search for Meaning that Viktor Frankl wrote. And it's like the study of the women who were taking care of kids with autism or parents with Alzheimer's. He found that the people who survived concentration camps weren't necessarily the most physically strong. They were the ones who had a sense of meaning. In other words, I got to survive this so I can get reunited with my family and my kids. I got to survive this so I can bear witness. I want to write a book about it. Whatever that was for them, that's what enabled them to survive. Many of you will end up, at least temporarily, in some really horrible, dire, extreme situations. Maybe not as bad as a concentration camp, but maybe worse. Who knows? But if you remember that that sense of meaning is what enables you and your colleagues and your subordinates to survive, that's a good thing, because it, it, it's, it's incredibly powerful. And that anything that brings us together, as I mentioned, is healing. All the spiritual traditions that you find in all the religions, once you get past the rituals that people you know, fight and kill each other over, um, you find certain themes of you know, altruism, forgiveness, compassion. Why? Because that's what frees us from our suffering, from feeling so isolated. That's what brings us together. And so the last slide I wanted to show is just if we can use the experience of suffering as a doorway for transforming our lives for the better, it creates a sense of meaning around that and purpose and ultimately makes it so uh, sustainable. So again, I just want to say how deeply I respect what you do, how grateful I am for the chance to, to be here today. I really honor and, and salute you and appreciate all the sacrifices that you've made. And I hope that if any part of this has been helpful to you, that you can pass it on to all the people that you'll come into contact with. So thanks so much for the chance to be here today. Thank you. Sure, 
I'm happy to stay for questions if I'm not overstaying my welcome here. Okay, any questions? Just yell them out or raise your hand. Don't be shy. You don't strike me as a shy group. <laughs> yes, in the back. Um, did I see a correlation between the who, people who succeeded and certain personality traits? You know, it's an interesting question. Um, did you all hear the question? The question was, did I see a correlation, did we see a correlation between uh, any personality traits that uh, were common in people who succeeded in, in making these changes? And we did, actually. But we actually developed, you know, uh, a battery of psychological tests, kind of the kind of things that Colonel Williams does, Dr. Williams does, um, and uh, to try to figure who, to, be, to predict who would do well on this program. And it's almost silly, but what we found, there were three questions that were the most predictive. Do you think you can do this? Do you think it'll help you? And did you ever do anything that you made a commitment to in your life that you were able to honor? And if the answer to those three questions were yes, most people were able to do it. Other questions or, or comments? Yes, sir. <coughs> Just wondering if you've seen uh, any marked improvement in some of the other uh, diseases that are common of old age, like osteoporosis and uh, glaucoma, things like that, if you've uh, expanded your study at all? Um, we haven't looked at glaucoma, osteoporosis, you know, any kind of strength training will help to prevent that. Osteoporosis is where your bones become more brittle. And people used to think it was a calcium deficiency, but it's actually an imbalance between calcium intake and calcium excretion. And when you eat a lot of animal protein, your body excretes more calcium. So people think drinking milk, for example, is a good way to build up your calcium, but you actually excrete more calcium than you actually take in because it's so high in the animal protein. So on a plant-based diet, people actually have less osteoporosis, even though they're consuming less calcium because they're excreting even less by comparison. We're about to do a study on breast cancer. You know, I'd love to do a study on uh, dementia. Um, you know, we're gonna look at breast cancer on both ends of the spectrum, the really super early breast cancer called ductal car carcinoma in situ, and the people who have like BRCA1 or BRCA2 genes like Angelina Jolie, you know, had a mastectomy just because her risk of breast cancer was so high. And we generally find that the sicker people are and the higher the risk of their, something bad happening, the easier we can actually show an improvement. So we're, we're interested. I think multiple sclerosis is likely to do well. We've done studies with autoimmune diseases that, we're, that are encouraging. We'd like to do more on you know, everything from rheumatoid arthritis to lupus to um, ankylosing spondylitis, things like that. So uh, I think that there's just a, we'd like to look at colon cancer because you find the same correlations there. So I, you know, I think we're limited only by our imaginations. Other questions or comments? Who's got the mic? Yeah, okay, sir, great. how about uh, traumatic brain injury? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, there are, um, there's a friend of mine at uh, Walter Reed um, who runs a foundation called the uh, Samueli Institute. And his name is Wayne Jonas. And he's been looking a lot at those things and finding that uh, um, things like uh, meditation, acupuncture, social support uh, can really help regain a lot of the lost function. Uh, those studies are still in progress, but if you're interested, look up, uh, the, Sam look up the Samueli. It's like Samuel with the I on the N foundation, and, and uh, look for Wayne Jonas, and just tell him I referred you to him, and he'll take your call. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Ornisha, well, my classmates want me to <coughs> ask you to prescribe less reading so that we can have decreased stress levels, but... <laughs> Don't blame me for that. <laughs> We think our exercise is inversely correlated with our level of reading. Uh, but in real, the, my real question is, are you aware of any uh, randomized proactive studies to look at uh, deep, your plan for the treatment of people who have failed suicide attempts? Uh, no, but that would be a really interesting study to do. I think that would be exciting. Uh, and maybe we'll do that. Or maybe you'll do that. It should be even more interesting. Maybe we can talk. I'd love to. <laughs> Send me an email. Sir. Where are you? Raise in the your back. Hand. Sorry. There you are. 
With uh, food prices on the rise, and you know, we kind of look at our younger soldiers and their families who aren't as economically advantaged probably as this population. Can you comment on, um, you know, with rising food prices, and you know, you talk about the diet, you know, just some of the things you've seen in some ways that are resources where we can help point people in the right direction. Yeah, that's an excellent question. You know, I um, in 1999 and 2000, I began consulting with the CEO of McDonald's. I actually took a lot of flack from my friends, you know, for, for doing that. And I said, well, you know, that's where the that's where the opportunity for change is. They have 41 now 43 million customers a day. Uh, that's a lot of people. So I I was the one who got them to put salads on the menu originally, and uh, we came up. The fruit salad was uh, fruit and walnut salad had like you know all this great stuff in it. But the real issue turned out, which I didn't fully appreciate at the time, was that the farm bill, the farm, the you know the agriculture bill, because of the perverse subsidies that the burger is 99 cents, the salad was 5.95, so you're on a fixed income, you get a lot more calories for your dollar by eating junk food, because the junk food is subsidized, because it doesn't really price into it the real cost of society, you know, all the, the ultimate diseases that you have to treat. So many of you guys and women are gonna be in um, positions of influence, and to the degree that you can use that influence to try to change those subsidies and really level the playing field, because the the irony, again, is this is a third world diet we're talking about. This is the way people used to eat before they could afford meat. You know, when countries like India or Japan or China become more prosperous, they, they want to, you know, the mark of prosperity is eating more meat. You know, after World War II, when America had one on its boom, it was like eating meat. I mean, I grew up in Texas eating meat three times a day, you know, chilies and cheeseburgers and chalupas, and I liked it. But I realized when I was 19 that if I stopped eating it, I, I, I felt better. I could do a lot more. It was uh, a choice worth making. So. To the extent that you can use your influence to change those subsidies, because ultimately the real cost of the, the healthiest foods are the cheapest foods. It doesn't have to be the way that it is now, and we, and we need to work to change that. Other comments or questions? What, I sir, do you drink coffee? Uh, back here. Ah. Do, do you drink coffee, and if so, do you monitor your intake? I don't drink coffee. I love coffee. Um, if I. <laughs> If I drink, this is after 40 years of meditation. If I, if I drink coffee, I'm like Robin Williams on speed, except I probably shouldn't use that example because Robin was a friend. Um, and uh, it, it, I'm just super sensitive to caffeine. But most people aren't. And so um, the problem, just so you understand, caffeine doesn't give you energy. You're borrowing energy. You know, you don't get something for nothing in life in general, and particularly in biology. And so when you have some caffeine, you get this shot of energy because you're kind of all your neurotransmitters are, are activated, but then after a while you get that low energy. You know, it's like if you take a pendulum and you let it go, it doesn't stop in the middle; it goes the other side. So you go up and then you go down. Now, people who use amphetamines or cocaine or crystal meth or you know extremes of that, they go way up and then they go way down. And there's a great cure for that way down feeling, which is more of whatever that drug was. In this case, caffeine. So people tend to you know. Um, get addicted to that. We, we used to do retreats where um, we would ask people to stop drinking caffeine, and they got so miserable on the first few days, because they they're literally going through, if you don't think you're addicted to caffeine, just stop drinking it. You, you literally go through withdrawal. It's not pretty. People get really tired and, and, and agitated and short-fused and all that kind of stuff. And I don't like the sense of being dependent, but I would still drink it if it didn't uh, affect me so much. So. If, there's some studies showing actually that coffee in moderation may actually be good for you if you're not one of the people like me that is so hypersensitive to it. But try not to drink, if you're gonna drink it, try not to drink more than two or three cups a day. Make sure you don't drink it at night because it, it real, will interfere with your sleep cycle. And most people don't get enough sleep and sometimes it's a badge of honor, yeah, I only got three hours sleep, you know, but it catches up with you. I mean, President Clinton has said publicly that the worst decisions he made as president, because he's famous for like staying up until you know, wee hours of the morning, uh, were when he was sleep deprived. So to the extent you can drink it and it doesn't interfere with your sleep cycle, then it's fine in moderation. I think I'm getting the hook here. Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> well, Dean, on behalf of the War College class of 2015, the Commandant, all the staff and faculty, we just want to say thank you for the very inspirational message. Thanks. Uh, the students they're in that social bonding of a seminar experience they'll give each other that support for all the readings uh, right <laughs> and, and and then they're going to make personal lifestyle changes as leaders starting with themselves and sharing with others and, so, and let me just add one thing in that same spirit you have a i don't have to tell you, you have this incredible opportunity here but 
really spend time getting to know people, get your, you know, connecting things, and, and stay in touch with each other. And spend just a few extra minutes, you know, just send a text message or an email. It doesn't have to be a long phone call or something. Those things really matter. They're good for your career. It's, you know, networking is always good for your career, but it's really good for your health, too. Thank you. And Thank you. On, on behalf of the assembled crowd, we have a, a little symbol of appreciation, a War College tie that we Thank hope you. you'll wear. And I will wear it proudly. Yes. Thanks, man.